Okay, so come on, go ahead and introduce the ministry since you were recording. <clears throat> um, the Tabernacle of Meeting, <clears throat> help from above. Uh, scripture is Revelation 21 3. That reads, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. Right? Revelation 21, 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them. <clears throat> they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. Right? The tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them. Take note, the tabernacle that Moses was told to set up while wandering in the wilderness represented the dwelling place of God on the earth. But this tabernacle of God is the reality of his presence. And he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. The essence of God, the essence of God's desire and man's purpose, right? The essence of God's desire and man's purpose. So God's desire is to live in close fellowship with man. And man's purpose is to be a people unto God. Right? And the next uh, verse that we have um, is Psalm 51, 10 through 12. We have the, uh, the uh, Psalm of Repentance from David. David wrote this after the incident with uh, with Bathsheba, right? <clears throat> here we see David. David's here we see David, God's chosen king, sin by having relations <clears throat> with another man's wife, Bathsheba. But God has something to say about David's abuse in power, and sends a, his prophet Nathan to call David out. Right in Second Samuel chapter twelve, we see Nathan, and Nathan uses a story to illustrate the seriousness of David's sin, and it's effective in calling David to repentance. There are still repercussions of David's sin, but because Nathan spoke the truth, David repented and avoided further punishment on Israel. And he said this. He wrote this in Psalm fifty-one, ten through twelve. He says, "Create in me." A clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Notice that created me oh, a clean heart, O oh God, right after the incident with Bathsheba, right? He says, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Lord, give it back to me and sustain me with that willing spirit. Notice that. Sustain me, Lord. With that willing spirit, right? The flesh, <clears throat> the spirit is willing, right? But the flesh is what? But the flesh weak. is weak, <clears throat> right? Mm -hmm. And so the next verse that we have is the, is Acts 16.30. Acts 16.30, we see the Philippian jailer uh, being set free. <clears throat> we set the, the Philippian jailer witness. Paul and Silas being set free while in prison for preaching Jesus. <clears throat> he saw that the chains were broken. And the Philippian jailer says this. He says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Right? <clears throat> he saw that man. Man, I want that. So he, he tells Paul and Silas, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Right? And he answers in Acts 16, 31. He says, man, just believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Notice that. Just believe, man. You will be saved, you and your household. So is anyone among you afflicted due to alcohol, due to depression, to anger, divorce, drug abuse, death of a loved one, mixed marriages, abandonment? Know that God loves you and it waits for you to respond and to respond to the call, right? God has a calling in your life and and he says, man, just, just respond. Respond to that call. I have a calling in your life. Amen. So that's the, uh, the tabernacle of me. 
help from above. That's who we are and that's what we're about. We're going to go ahead and move forward and have one of you guys pray us in. Amen. Um, we know Lalo prayed us out last week. Uh, well, Evangelist Richard, do you want to pray us in? And then lead us into worship and then we'll have uh, maybe uh, Lalo read the introduction. Amen. So you do us that favor. <clears throat> Hermano Richard, pray us in. Your speaker's off, Brother Richard. Thank you. Yeah, I had to turn it off because, you know, there's noise over here, so I apologize. But I'd be honored to uh, do the worship. I'm trying to get another uh, phone going on, Brother. Uh, but do um, you want me, was somebody going to pray a sin, Pastor? I was going to have you pray a sin, but I don't know. If Jimmy's available, Jimmy can do it, or... I don't know if he, Jimmy just zoomed in or not. I can, okay. If he doesn't, then then I'll uh, try to get well, another. Oh, well, I'll, I'll pray a sin. I'll pray a sin. And then, huh? and then, and I'll pray a sin, and then you can do the worship for us. Okay. All right. So, Father in heaven, we come before your presence, Lord. And God, we pray that you would take full, con full control, that you would take full authority over this Bible study, Father God. Lord, that your spirit would move like you did at the beginning in the Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, that reads that the spirit of the living God moved upon the face of the deep. And Father, I pray that you would move mightily upon this Bible study, Father God. The Lord, that it would this study would touch those hearts and those lives, Father God, that are hungry and that are thirsty for your word, Father God. Lord, Move mightily, God. Touch those lives, God. So, Father, we ask and we pray this in the name of Jesus, Father God. That, Lord, anyone that might be hurting, struggling in their life, Father God, physically, spiritually, emotionally. Lord, that's struggling in their health, Lord God. That, Lord, that you would speak tonight. And, Lord, that it would touch them, Father God. Lord, that you would meet them right where they're at. And, God, that you would shed that light. And God, that you would touch them, right? We were learning about Job, right? And Job, Job 12, 10, Job chapter 12, verse 10 reads, And whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? Lord, that's you. Lord, you hold our breath in your very own hand, Father. Lord, you told us in Isaiah 43, 10 and 11, it says, Before me, there was no other God formed. Neither shall be any after me, for I am the Lord. And besides me, yeah. There is no other Savior. Lord, you're the Savior of mankind. And whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So God, we're calling out to you. Lord, to heal our nation. Lord, to heal our churches, Father God. We pray for a revival, Father God. We pray for the spirit of the living God, Lord. To move mightily, God. But Lord, we pray for those who are being persecuted, Lord. <clears throat> in Afghanistan and all, you know, those parts of the country that Lalo mentioned earlier, Father God. Like Lalo said, it's easier for us to speak. But, you know, he says that, man, when I put myself in that position, you know, man, Lord, Lord, just meet them where they're at, God. Pour out your spirit upon them, Lord. Protect them, Lord, against the powers of darkness, Father. We plead the blood of Jesus upon our nation, Father God, upon those countries, Father. Those who are, like Lalo said, some of their brothers and sisters are there. We plead the blood of Jesus upon them, Lord. Have mercy. In Jesus' name. God, we ask for forgiveness, Father God. That's what we should be asking for. Forgiveness. Forgive us, Father God, for sinning against you in any way, shape, or form, Lord. Cleanse us with your blood. Fill us with your spirit. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Um, okay, hermano Richard, let's, do, let's uh, lead us into the worship. Okay, praise the Lord. Amen. And uh, this is like the third phone I use, Pastor, so I don't know how this one. How the, how this no, that's okay. Out. I mean, uh, we get the worship in, that'll be cool. Okay, I hope it sounds okay. Praise the Lord. Because just like when I pray and I do worship, I say, Lord, let me be effective, Lord. I want to honor you just as the brothers we were speaking earlier tonight.
Lalo and, and Ernie, we want to be vessels of honor, Lord. So, Lord, uh, and as, as Pastor Junior spoke early, Lord, that, that uh, as we want and are willing to honor you, Lord, Father God, that you prepare us to be those vessels of honor, Lord, Father God. But Lord, now we come to you, Lord, and thankfully, Lord, Father God, that you have us come to you, Lord, and, and a person in our life. So thank you, Lord. To you be all the glory, all the honor, all the praise, Lord, for you're worthy to be praised. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. So this is the this is the day that the Lord has made. Amen. Son, that whoever believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life, and not just life, but life and life abundantly. Hallelujah! Because I say by his grace and mercy, give me life and hope and peace and victory. Because I am saved. His grace and mercy, He gives me life and abundant, abundantly. Hey, Hallelujah, Amen. Amen. Amen, amen. brother. Beautiful. Music. I said, "What? Well, it's still there." I didn't hear any Amen. Come and agree with me, brothers. Amen. This is Amen. the day that he came to give us life and life abundantly. Hallelujah. I don't I don't know if I'm supposed to like that song that much, bro, but I love that song. I, 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 I forgot how good it was till you just played it again. I was I was listening to it and I'm inside I'm rocking out, enjoying it. I'm like, am I supposed to even be enjoying this song that much? It's that good. Good, good brother. Well, you know, I know God's enjoying it. So it's we're 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 in full ship and wherever. Two or three are gathering in his name. There he is in the midst. No, so uh, I believe and I would be thankful and grateful just to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, how do you say? Uh, you know, uh, we're all honoring him right here. Amen. Good we stuff. all honor the Lord. We come no, together and agree. We come together in fellowship. Mm. We come together to worship him in spirit and truth. Amen. Hallelujah. You got this a, is a, a beautiful talent. Thank you for sharing it with us, brother. God bless you. I am, I am, I am uh, so grateful and honored. So grateful, and honored. Thank you, Lord. To you be all the glory, Jesus Christ. Blessed is the man, that man who does not walk in the way of the wicked. Blessed is the man, that man who does not sin, sit in the seat of the mocker. Blessed is the man, blessed is the man, 
Blessed is the man that man for his delight is in the law of the Lord. Blessed is the man that man who meditates on the word for day and night. For he shall be like a tree that's planted by the sea. season and whatever he does will prosper all that he does succeed his lead shall not wither not so the wicked Ooh. there will be like chaff that the wind will That the wind will blow away and for the wicked man in the judgment will not stand nor the sinner in the assembly of the righteous for god watches over the way the way of godly men but the way of the wicked their way will Blessed is the man, that man for his delight is in the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Gracias. Amen. Nothing like some worship, man, before that. I mean, Amen. it's... This is what oh, Am Grand Blob said. She said, "Our worship of Christ is much. Is, our worship of Christ must always come before our work for Christ, right? <clears throat> our worship for our worship of Christ must always come before our work for Christ, right? <clears throat> God will God will refuse to accept worship that is half-hearted or less." than what he deserves. Worship that requires little of us is likewise worth little to God. Notice that. God will refuse to accept worship that is half-hearted or less than what he deserves. Worship that requires little of us likewise worth little to God. Man, does that not speak volume? Right. I mean, half-hearted he worship. Is he is worthy to be praised and to be worshipped of all honor right. and glory. Amen. Amen. So worship that, requi worship that requires little of us is likewise worthy little to God. Amen. Amen. So, man, God deserves more than that. More than that. Not more for what that. he's done, but for who he is right i mean i think of revelation 4 11 right i quote that one often <laughs> that says for you are worthy O lord to receive glory honor and power for you created all things and by their and by your perfect will you know we exist they exist right for god's perfect will Amen. you know we exist they exist right and we're not living according to God's will, then that's how we tend to <clears throat> stray away. We tend to have difficulty, right? We're like, man, you know. Um, we we get to we were in our faith, right? Why am right. I even here? <laughs> why, you know, why was I even born? Right? I oh mean, man, the things, the things we've said and thought. It just goes on and on. Yeah. You know, but we were created for him. Right? And in his image, to praise him, to worship him, 
two hands to lift up, two hands to put together to pray, you know, honor him. Praise the Lord. He right. could have created he could have created us into any image, but he created it, created us in his image. Right. Amen. Okay, let's go ahead and I don't know, Lalo. Lalo, you gonna read the introduction? Are you available or I don't know, he's on mute. I can read the introduction if he's not. I think I have char charge enough. Yeah, I have charge. The um, introduction? Uh, yeah, you want to go ahead and do us that favor? I'd love to, Pastor. Thank you. Is Lalo there? Okay, no, I don't know. He's not, he's not responding. Okay, I'll read it. Pastor, thank you. Well, it says, uh, man of God, we are once again moving forward in the book of Job, chapter 16 and 17 for tonight. The title of my message is Speak Well and Help Those in Need. Take note on chapter 16, verse 2, that reads, I have heard many such things. Miserable comforters are you all. And in chapter 13, verse 4, Job said that they all were worthless physicians. Yeah, rather than helping him, Job's friends added to his misery and made his situation even worse. For they contributed to his mental anguish and accused him of sin. Once they start speaking to him, they did him no good at all. Here we learn that Job's friends were worthless physicians because they didn't properly diagnose Job's situation. He states that his friends are like doctors that misdiagnose a condition and pursue a treatment that is wrong and unhelpful. And so they assume that Job's suffering is related to some secret sin in his life. But we also can assume things about people and completely misjudge them. Amen. But here is the word of exhortation. And that is, as Christians, we are to be a blessing to others. And may I ask, are you misjudging anyone? Can someone say that you have completely misdiagnosed their situation and failed to help them? And are you lacking compassion toward those around you? Even if you have compassion on them, are you actually helping them? Keep in mind what Job is complaining about here is what his friends had said to him. So yeah, let your speech be a blessing to others. See you guys tonight. Amen. Were we talking about that earlier? <laughs> right. I mean, you were saying you were saying about about misjudging misjudging your family, right? Yeah. Or yeah. Mis, misjudging others. Yeah. And I gotta take a look at you know like how the you know not everybody's on the same level, you know. Right. But the the this the Holy Spirit comes quick, you know. And uh, give you some understanding, discernment to, to uh, be able to check yourself before you wreck yourself. Right. Before you speak those things. And, and, and I, that's where I fall short. <laughs> but to God be yeah. glory, from glory to glory, he uh, chastises us and corrects us. And uh, God forgive me. Right. I mean, his friends did well when they were, when they were, um, you know, when they sat with him, right? We spoke about that last time. They sat with him for seven days, seven nights. I mean, they did well. <clears throat> and we're supposed to do that, right? When you got nothing good to say, because don't even say it. <laughs> you know, just sit there and mourn, right? Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, it's the best thing that, that for the other person, for you, just not just to sit there. And, I mean, we think about it. <clears throat> That his friends couldn't even recognize him because all the boils on his body and everything. I mean, they, they couldn't recognize him. That's why they tore their clothes, you know. But Job, you know, but Job tore his clothes and shaved his hair, you know, shaved his head. I mean, even though they didn't shave their head, <laughs> um, we see that they tore their clothes, they threw ashes, they sat with him, and they just waited and just waited, you know. And we have chapter two, chapter. I mean, we have chapter two, three. Uh, Joe, you know, Joe began to speak. 
Uh, and then you have Eliphaz, right? He starts to speak in chapter four. Um, then you have Bildad in chapter eight. And then you have Zophar in chapter 11, which, which kind of like put the frosty on the cake and said, hey, you know what? <laughs> 11 verse six, right? And as far as your children are concerned, Job, they transgressed against the Lord and God killed them. Really? To agree with father? I mean, you know, like we spoke about before, right? I mean, losing one child is enough, man. You know? <clears throat> now, 10 children. But Job here is, um, is, is, you know, he's talking to his friends. He's like, miserable comforters are you? I mean, I went to, uh, I went to uh, chapter 13, 4, because he called them worthless physicians. <clears throat> you know, that's what that reminded me of right here in verse uh, six, uh, chapter 16, when he called them miserable comforters, you know? Um, and in chapter 13, he called them worthless physicians, worthless physicians because they failed to diagnose Job, you know, so they didn't help him, right? But there's a few things we're going to learn tonight, and that is <clears throat> that they were worthless, worthless physicians, right? Rather than helping him, Job's friends added to his misery, <clears throat> just like in our introduction. They made his situation worse. They contributed to his mental anguish. They accused him of sin. They mocked him. Once they started speaking to him, they did him no good. Job says it's better that they, if it would, Job says it would be better if they would just keep quiet. Right? <clears throat> we see that in verse five of, of Job chapter 13. Right? <clears throat> and so. The other thing that we see here is that, uh, I mean, they didn't properly diagnose Job, right? Job says that his friends are like doctors <clears throat> that misdiagnose a condition and pursue a treatment that is wrong and helpful. They assume that Job's suffering was related to some great sin in his life. Therefore, they spent a great deal of time urging him to confess his sin and to, re and to repent of it right <clears throat> we live in a difficult world and it is often it's often hard to know what to do <clears throat> to help those who are suffering another problem is that we naturally lack compassion we see this in jesus disciples in john chapter 9 we read that last week right in john chapter 9 <clears throat> i think we had jimmy jimmy came in towards the end right uh, and john John chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, right? We read that. As long as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind, right? <clears throat> the, the first reaction of the disciples was not to have compassion on the man for being born blind, but to ask if he or his parents had sinned that this tragedy had come upon him, right? So we assume, we often assume things about people and completely misjudge them. We don't have compassion on people. We think ill of them and don't even attempt to help them, right? The third problem is that even if we have compassion, we still often fail to help people. Job's three friends had compassion towards Job when they came to Job, after they heard his trouble, they wept. They tore their clothes. They sprinkled dust on their heads. They sat with him for seven days to support him and his suffering. So we should commend them for that. But even though they had compassion on their friend, they were what? They were worthless physicians, right? What Job says here about his friends it reminds us of the woman mentioned in Mark chapter 5 who had a subject of bleeding for 12 years. Notice that. What Job says here about his friends it reminds us of the woman mentioned in Mark chapter 5 who had a subject to bleeding for 12 years. Notice that. 12 years. 12 years going to the doctor. Let's read that. Let's go to Mark chapter 5. Uh, Mark chapter 5, let's go to the New Testament, right? Matthew, Mark. Matthew is the first uh, book of the New Testament. 
and Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament, but um, Mark chapter 5, let's read that. Woman, <clears throat> right, had an issue of, of blood for 12 full years. So we're going to learn something here in Mark chapter 5. Matthew, Mark, chapter 5. Let's start at um, let's see here. Uh, verse twenty-five. Let's go ahead and um, let's see. Yeah, let's read. Let's start with verse twenty-five. If you're there, say Amen. Amen. Uh, go ahead and take it, Ernie. Mark. Chapter 5, verse 25. Yeah. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him and the crown and the crowd and touched his cloth. Cloth. Because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. To, to, to what verse, Pastor? Oh, no, just keep going. Keep going. At once, at once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you. His disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell on his feet and trembling with fear, told him the, tr the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Right. Well, um, 35. Uh, no, that's good right there. Because it's going to go to, it's going to go into something, something, another story. Uh, but this is what we learn here. <clears throat> I mean, 34 speaks volume right there, right? Let me read 34 again. 34. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Right. And she went to what? To the physicians. Uh, verse 26 is, and he had and had suffered many things from from many positions, she has spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. Notice that. I mean, your Bible doesn't say position, but mine does. <laughs> I mean, I have the, the New King James. But at all most, I mean, like, yeah, right? So she suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had. Yet instead, she got worse, Right? So they took her money <clears throat> and they didn't help her at all. So yeah, she had even, she even got, she was, she, she, yeah. So yeah, she's better. She was better off not going to them at all. But Job said of these, Job said that of his three friends here, Job needed help. His friends should have helped him. Right. <clears throat> and, um, but we see, we see another story here, right? We see, we see uh, Jonathan, Jonathan, King Saul's son. When King Saul was trying to kill David, David had to flee. 
right? It was a difficult time for David for a while. For a while, he was alone, right? <clears throat> so we compare that. We compare Job's friends to Jonathan, King Saul's son, and David, right? <clears throat> Here you have the story of, jo of David fleeing from, from uh, King Saul, right? And Jonathan was, was Saul's son. But look at what Jonathan does uh, in 1 Samuel um, 21, I believe. Let's see. Let's go back to the Old Testament. 1 Samuel chapter 21, I believe. Let's see. I'm going to go past Job. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 23. Wait. 21. Let me see if that's the verse I was looking for. Yeah, it's that first statement of, of 1 Samuel 21 1. I guess we can read from 1, uh, one to 3. If you're there, you want to say amen? Say amen. Take it. Was that what the learning? Oh, the who? Jimmy, you want to read? Brother Jimmy. You have your speaker off, Brother Jimmy. Your speaker's off. I know we were on Mark, and then I got up to go to the restroom, but what oh. did we go to after Mark? Okay. We went to uh, 1 Samuel 21. Uh, 1 it. Samuel 21, 1 and 2, because what we're comparing is that Job's friends, compare, we're comparing Job's friends to Jonathan, King Saul's son. Right, King Saul, I mean, uh, Saul, son, Jonathan and David, they had, the, uh, they had a, a strong relationship, right? They had a bond, a brotherhood bond, right? Blood for blood, right? 1 um, Samuel, uh, what? Chapter Samuel. Uh, first, it's First Samuel chapter twenty one verse uh, verses one and two is fine. Okay. Yeah, well, I like this chapter. First one, correct? Um. Yeah. Verses one and two. Twenty one. Verse one. So David went to Nob and Amalek, the priest. Amalek trembled when he met with him and asked, Why are you alone? Why is no one with you? David answered Amalek, the priest. The king sent me on a mission and said to me, No one is to know anything about the mission I am sending you on. As for my men, I have told them to meet me at a certain place. Is that correct? Am I reading the right uh, one? Yeah, that's no, that's correct. I mean, the the um, the statement of it's in verse one <clears throat> as to why are you here alone and no one is with you, right? I mean, here he's fleeing. Here he's fleeing from Saul. Right, he's there by himself. Um, in this chapter, he's where he reads, where is where he uh, eats the showbread. Um, but it also this chapter also tells us of of, of uh, of the sword. Uh, remember when uh, David was a young boy and he slew a giant Goliath with three smooth stones, right? He just hit him right in the forehead. <laughs> he came down. So, you know, the sword, here's where he recovers. Here, here's where he recovers the sword. Um, but um, let me... Um, I guess we can read that. I found that very interesting too. I mean, we've been through Samuel, right? But the verse we wanted to, the, the verse that, <clears throat> that we were referring to is that one, that David was alone, right? David was alone. And then we see in chapter 23, 16, if you can read that, chapter 23, verse 16. So we can see what Jonathan, Jonathan, that went to David when he was alone. His father was trying to kill him. 
One of you guys can read that, 23. <clears throat> um, 15 and 16. And 17 is fine. On Samuel 1, 15? Uh, Samuel 23, 15, 16, and 17. Okay. Samuel 23, verse 15. While David was at Horish in the desert of Sif, he learned that Saul had come out to his life, to take his life. And Saul's son, Jonathan, went to David at Horish and helped him find strength in God. Don't be afraid, he said. My father, Saul, will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel, and I will be second to you. Even my father, Saul, know, Saul knows his. Saul knows, knows this. The two of them made a covenant before the Lord. Then Jonathan went home, but David remained at Horish. Right. Right. They made that covenant, that pact. The covenant, right? Yes. Um, the covenant is a sacred trust. A covenant is a sacred trust between two people, right? <clears throat> That's what that is. <clears throat> it's like you would give your blood for, you know, my blood for your blood. That was blood for blood. You know, they had that sacred trust between both of them. Um, we saw, But here we see that uh, Saul is, willing, is chasing after David to kill him, right? <clears throat> because God had taken the throne away from Saul. But Jonathan knew the truth, right? Jonathan knew that that it was David the one who was going to be king, right? <clears throat> but David here was, I mean, he didn't go before the Lord. He just waited, waited for the Lord to put him up there, <clears throat> to put him as king. I mean, he was already anointed as king, but he waited for the Lord. He didn't go before the Lord. He didn't say, okay, well, God made me king, and I'm just going to go and slay everybody. <laughs> Who comes my way? No. He waited patiently for God to put him there. He was already anointed, but God waited for him. I mean, he waited for God. Right? Psalm 46, 10 says, be still and know that I'm God. Right? So this man's running. David, he's already knows he's a king, but he's running from Saul. But he knows that God's going to take care of Saul. Right? God's going to take care of your enemies. But he had this uh, bond with, uh, with Jonathan, right? It was his brother in Christ. And he says, man, I, you know, I already know what's happening here. You know, but what's comforting is that is Jonathan, he was a better comforter than Job's three friends were. You know what I mean? He strengthened him. Um, Jonathan strengthened David. Right? Verse 16 reads, Then Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David in the woods and strengthened his hand in God. Notice that. He strengthened his hand in God. I mean, compared to Job's three friends here. I mean, that's why he called them worthless physicians, miserable comforters, right? <clears throat> and what did he say in verse 7? He says, don't be afraid. My father will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel, and I will be second to you. Even my father Saul knows that. See? <clears throat> so Jonathan reminded David of God's promise. God had promised David that he would be king over Israel. Samuel had anointed him. Jonathan reminded him of this. It had to be so. Nothing could stop it. <clears throat> and so as Christians, you are to be a blessing to others. Right? <clears throat> Just like we read in our statement. I mean, our introduction. <clears throat> are you misjudging anyone? Can anyone... Can someone say about you that you have completely misdiagnosed their situation and failed to help them? Are you lacking in compassion towards those around you? Even if you have compassion on them, are you actually helping them? Right? Because we can have compassion on people. But are we actually helping them? Right? That's the question that we need to ask ourselves. Right? It's like saying, okay, pues, why you that? I'm going to help you or whatever. Right? But are you doing it in good faith? <laughs> Right? 
you're not just doing it just to help them. And, you know, you're, are you actually helping the guy or not? You know, uh, Matthew 5, 16 says, let your light shine before men and that they may see good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. Right? I mean, there has to be uh, your love for that person, your compassion. I mean, Jesus had great compassion for the people. And so Job was complaining <clears throat> about here is that his friends that had said to him, and verse five, he told them that he wished they would that they would shut up, right? Amen. I mean, when he started speaking, right? <clears throat> he says, "Man, I just I wish he would he would be quiet." Uh, in Job thirteen five, let's look at that. Job thirteen five. Job 13, verse 5. Amen. What does that say? What does that say, Brother Richard? Oh, that you would be silent and it would right? be your wisdom. Right. Right. Um, what did we learn from that? We learned what, what uh, Paul wrote to the Ephesians. <clears throat> right? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 and 30, what does that say? Ephesians what? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 and 30. Remember, yeah. your speech is to be a blessing to others. Right? I'm just like just like we compared the uh, Job's friends to Jonathan. I mean, that Jonathan strengthened David in the Lord. Mm. Right? And no matter what our friends are going through, our brothers and sisters in Christ, we're to strengthen them in the Lord. Amen. Right? <clears throat> we to lead them to the truth and encourage them. You know, not just to mm. throw them under the bus. Right? Right. No, we're to, we're to speak a blessing on them. That's why it says, you know, let your speech be a blessing to others. Right? But Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 and 30, for they're saying that. It's, it's in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. I know I'm making you guys flip your Bibles, but praise the Lord. That's how you get to know your Bible, right? <laughs> Can you go learn and forget it? Yeah, me can say it's too hard. <laughs> I know. Amen. Amen. You know, there's some people that used to say, well, don't go to that church because they make you flip a lot of pages, you know? And then, then some then some churches are like, well, don't go to that church because they don't flip any pages. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know what's coming into my head, Pastor, is I'm just admiring you to where how you know these verses by heart and just making a trip to the pages and you know it from heart. It just makes me feel like very comfortable. I'm with the right man. Like, wow, I, you're so blessed. Like, just by you going through this chapter, oh, in chapter verse, and then this chapter verse, I, I'm all like, wow, Pastor, that is beautiful. So one day I'll be in your shoes. And that's very blessing to have that knowledge and well, wisdom. When you start reading, you know, God gives you those verses and you just start reading. You go, oh, okay, this verse, you know, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. it's all about, you know, you memorizing scripture too, you know, <clears throat> and, and, you know, memorizing scriptures too, is it, it's how bad do you want it? Come on. How bad do you want to learn that? <laughs> I mean, it bothered me. That's why I learned. That's why I memorized scripture. I try to memorize scripture every day. I try to memorize some some scripture, and and I and I won't go to the next verse until until I memorize it completely. Once I memorize it completely and I wrote it everywhere, in my car, in the bathroom, in my study. Once I fully in my in my toolbox, I memorize it. You know, I got to write it again. I'll remember it and I'll write it and I'll write it and I'll write it. You know, because it helps to write it. <clears throat> you know, when you're memorizing. You know. When you're memorizing, you always have to be writing it, right? Let's say you're sitting at the doctor's office or let's say you're waiting for somebody or let's say whatever, you know, let it come to your mind. I always have a notepad with you. I say, oh, okay, well, you know, Ephesians 4, 29, Ephesians 5, 18 to be, you know, mm -hmm. be angry and sin not, you know, Ephesians 4, 26, you know, just, just challenge you, challenge yourself, you know? <clears throat> I mean, that's basically how I memorize scripture because it used to bother me. It used to bother me to go to church and I hear the pastor quote this, 
quote a verse and he's not giving it to me. And I'm like, man, was, you know, I'll hunt for it. And I go, this was the verse. You know, I go, man, I'm going to memorize that verse. <laughs> Next time I hear it, I already know where the address is. <laughs> it used to bother me that. It used to bother me when, when I used to hear a sermon, they don't quote the, they quote the scripture, but they don't give me the verse, chapter and verse. That used to bother me a lot. That's why I used to take notes and I go, I'm going to find me that verse. I'd find it and I memorize it and I write it and I write it and I write it. Uh, but yeah, anyways, uh, Ephesians 4:29, uh, 29 to 30. You there, Mano Richard? Yes. I, I, oh, you wanted me to read it? Yeah. Okay, good. Because I, I thought I don't have it memorized. I'm sorry, Pastor. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I'm like, oh, oh, wait a minute. I was just going back to Job because uh, 13, 13 says something good about the speak about you know speaking something. But I read chapter uh, chapter four verses uh, 29 and 30. You said on Ephesians, correct? Yeah. Amen. Uh, verse 29 says 29 and 30 okay let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption right Amen. I mean I honestly think that Job's friends were grieving the Holy Spirit <laughs> <laughs> right i mean because they weren't they weren't encouraging job at all remember job was at the at the peak of his suffering <laughs> you know he was at the peak of his suffering when he really needed the most he needed his wife the most he really needed his friends the most you know and what did they do they just they just lash at him and they lash at him you know yeah. i mean your kids i mean even his wife wasn't able to comprehend him she wasn't able to understand. I mean, her her um, counsel was, man, just, you know, like we said earlier, you know, just commit suicide, man. I know, right? You know, how, how was Joe going to kill himself? Just kill yourself, you know? Curse God and die. You know, well, how am I going to die? Not unless, I, not unless I hang myself. Oh, not unless I kill myself, you know? I'm going to curse God and hang myself? Really? I mean, couldn't you give me a better counsel than that? You're my wife. <laughs> Jeez, where's her compassion? Gosh. Her compassion, you know? right? And sometimes your wife will tell you something off the wall, and you're like, "What? Well, I know that ain't from God." You know, right. God's never God's never going to tell you to commit suicide, Paul. If you're listening to me right now, God's never going to tell you to commit suicide. Amen. Right? <clears throat> I mean, He created you. He said, "He says, Thou shalt not kill." You know, for you to commit suicide is, is going against God's word. You know, mm -hmm. I'm God's never going to tell you to commit suicide, no matter what. <clears throat> um, I'm 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 a Lord, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, sl a slow learner, and sometimes I don't understand words. That's why I have difficulty in learning or understanding certain things. But in on that verse 29 and 30, on 30, where it's, where it says, um, "Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God." What is the word "grieve"? Like. To, um, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Pastor. No, dale, dale. No, uh, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, meaning like, uh, you know, grieving is sorrow, you know, sorrow and, 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 and uh, a, a sad feeling, you know, grieving oh. it kind of your heart's in pain, you know, and uh, there's the, the opposite of, of grieving is to be comforted in joy, you know, so we want to we want to please God. And that it says the only thing that pleases God is faith. But I'm sure that if we're praising God and faithfully, that's the opposite of grieving the Holy Spirit of God. So right here, by, by speaking these things, uh, you know, it says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But, you know, edify, build up, bless. Because like, uh, you know, you speak Christians are blessing. So you want to you wanna not grieve God and the Holy Spirit. Bless him and, and, and please him. And, uh, you know, because this mouth that we have, God gave it to us. And the tongue we have, God gave it to us. And so, mm -hmm. like Pastor saying about learning scripture that God gave us, we've got to learn these things and speak blessings, speak 
edif edification to people. You know, I'm guilty, man. I, I, I get mad, you know, and I say things I shouldn't say. But people love me. I get I, angry and I fall short. And they do the same thing. It goes back and forth. Hey, just like Job's wife, how Pastor was saying, she was saying, why don't you just kill yourself? And get it over with. Those words she said, she should have never spoke those things, you know. But the grieving, to answer your question, uh, Brother Ernie, to grieve, to make sorrow, make, make sad, you know, make, make, to bring sorrow or sadness. Mm. Okay. I understand. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, that you could also, uh, I, I probably Google will give you a better explanation word for word, but you know, that's what it means to me. No, you explained it very well. Pretty much when we all get together, do not speak about, ah, I'm so messed up. This is going wrong. This is, in other words, complain. Just be yeah. grateful what we have, right? Yeah, but we complain, and, and it's okay to, like, uh, you know, maybe get something off our chest, but we got to be careful, like, speaking to others, you know, and impart grace to the hearer, you know, like it says in verse uh, 29 to, to, you know, when we, we, we speak into somebody, we impart into them, you know, grace, you know, uh, favor, uh, you know, blessing, uh, healing. Uh, joy, peace, wisdom, those good things that are edifying, that build up. Mm, amen. Well, like, you, know, like, you know what they're trying to say yeah. is, because I have all this underlined, I was studying this before, uh, I have it all highlighted, underlined, because I was, I work with guys that are in law enforcement, and a big, big, uh, really dirty habit that most law enforcement guys have and I always criticize them is when they're talking amongst each other, for some reason, they like to use the F word all the time. You can talk to some of these guys just in a simple conversation, like you and I were talking like, Hey, how's it going, brother? How you been? How's the family? Well, the way they talk about it is like, Hey, how are you effing doing today, man? I haven't seen you F in a F in long time. You know, I was down here. Uh, at this other effing location I had to deal with this effing guy and man he just effing made me so mad that I had to eff him up and but you know what it was effing okay you know and I'm thinking like man I just talked to this guy for five minutes and he's already said 15 f words in one paragraph and I'm thinking why does he have to do that why does he why can't he just leave the foul language out he's a grown man he says he believes in god he he tries to be godly but the way he speaks is so immoral and i would tell them i would say you know god doesn't really like when you speak like that he doesn't appreciate that he gave you the gift of speech not all people can speak some people are deaf mutes so they don't even have the ability to speak so he gave us a gift the miracle of speech and this is how you use it and they don't understand that. And I, and I tell them, I say, you don't need to speak to me like that. When you're talking to me like that, you should probably talk to me later when you get that all out. And then sometimes when I'm working around these guys, I'll walk up to them and somebody will say, oh, oh, stop talking about that stuff because here comes Camacho and he doesn't like when you cuss. And I said, that's right. You don't need to cuss. We're all mature. We're all adults. And it's not professional. And it's not good for us. God does not want to hear that. With your words, you will be uplifted. And with your words, you will be condemned. And, and, and I remember, I didn't like it whenever they were saying these bad words and cursing, just casually throwing it out there. And I noticed it's like that on TV now all the time. And more and more people casually say the F word all the time. I mean, there's okay. There's a time when it, you know, you you smash your finger on something, or you, you you hurt yourself so much, you might yell that out by accident, and you ask the Lord, forgive me. You know, I didn't realize that. But there's some people that just feel it's just so casual and so cool and so easy to just talk like that. That I I started to look it up, and then I looked it up, and I said, you know, is it what is the what does God think about people who curse? And this came out. That's why I looked it up. Ephesians 4.29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come from your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that may benefit those who listen. So when we talk to people, we're like, how are you doing, brother? Everything good? Well, 
It's good to see you, Ken. I'll be praying for you and your family. God bless you. God bless your family. You know, like Juan used to always say, wherever you're going, you know, may God have travel mercies on you. You know, we do that. When I see uh, people at uh, jobs, I always tell them, how are you? How is your family? So good to see you. I always enjoy seeing you. I always enjoy talking to you. And may God be with you and bless you. And, and, and you feel good. And they feel good. And we encourage each other. And we become closer like Jonathan and David because we have the same love for God and we have the same thoughts and feelings. But when we let unwholesome talk come from our mouths, I don't want to hear somebody talk like that. I can't wait to stop talking to them. I don't want to talk to them. And I have to tell them, don't talk to me. And now a lot of those guys, they know when they call me or talk to me, they're like, they don't do it. And when they do do it, they say, oh, sorry about that. Um, uh, excuse me about that. And they start all over. We have to be willing to understand that and not just be part of that. And, uh, and let others know in a kind, respectful way that we don't want to be part of that. And we don't need to be part of that. God gave us a gift. We should use it well in his, you know, in his honor. And that's when it says that, you know, we should not, therefore, use obscenity or foolish talk or coarse joking, which are out of place. No, you know, it's, it's, it's not good. And um, that's what it says. Be amongst you, uh, no improper speeches uh, that's what we do uh, but yeah let's be careful what we say how we how we talk it's important uh, but that's what I looked at that's what I I, I realized because it, it goes on a lot of people do that in, in the movies I mean I watch movies we all do but if I have to hear in the movies that they're always over and over and over f and f and this and that, you know what I don't need to hear that I just, I don't, that doesn't make me happy. I turn it off or change the channel. And it's, some people think it's cool. Some people think it's okay because that's the way the world is acceptable now, but it's not. We all know back in the days when people would say the F word, everybody would turn around and look like, oh my God, who said that? You know, now it's like they're casually throwing it out over the place, left and right, like it's casual conversation. But that's what I got from it. That's good, wow. Jimmy. Brother Jimmy, it's almost, it's almost like like you bringing back back in the days to where we're forgetting that the United States is God's nation in God we trust. Therefore, we need to follow His. Um, uh, you, you said you you said the word a little while ago. You said um, His morals, and there's morals. And if we're representing God's nation in God we trust, that's the number one thing morals we need to learn, especially when you're representing a nation, right? Yes. Yes. The world, our, our country is beginning to be like just uh, no respect for God. Even in the commentaries, it says that it says here five, four obscenity and coarse joking are so common now that we begin to think they're fine and normal. But Paul cautions that improper language should have no place in a Christian's conversation because it does not reflect God's presence in us. How can we praise God and remind others of his goodness when we are speaking cruelly or crudely or bad, you know, bad with bad language? We, we can't do that. You can't, you know, say you love God. And then the other hand, talking with, a, with you know, of, with the gestures of, you know, bad words and, you know, it's obscenities and curse words. It, it doesn't it doesn't match you know that's why a lot of people i tell them i go oh yeah a lot of people believe in god but do they walk with god do they love god if they love god they wouldn't do that they know god's not happy when he hears that they know that and he's definitely not encouraging us to do that so you're not walking with god if you're if if he's not encouraging you to do the right thing you just believe in god but you're not really you don't have a holy spirit and a bond of god so that's why we have to be careful. It's so common now. It, it, it really is. You watch all the movies. They're all, I, I always say, wow, you know, why do they just so casually use the F word so much? It's kind of weird. It's kind of strange, the society, the way it's become. And, and this Bible, this chapter, I think it's warning us not to become like that. Amen. 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 That's good, Jimmy. Amen, Jim. Yeah, when it says in verse 29, no, let no corrupt word, that's cursing. It's not just like talking bad uh, about somebody or, you know, uh, 
you know, talking down on somebody. That's that's the language. No corrupt word, you know, because, uh, you know, when I was in the world, that's the way I talked all the time. And like Jimmy said, you know, they gave that example of that brother. Like how many times did he use that word in a paragraph? You know, I mean, I remember my sister said, you know, how many times you just said the that word? And I said, I don't. And then I said the word again, care, you know, because I didn't at the time. But once you have the Holy Spirit, you're born again, you have the Holy Spirit, start changing you. You start, you know, trans, trans, a transformation happens and you become a new person. And you might slip up and say it, but you say, God, forgive me. You know, before you wouldn't even think twice about it, you know, and you just repent and, you know, you move on. You don't uh, walk in uh, condemnation, but you just like, well, I, I messed up. You know, you'll jump on the flesh, but, you know, your speech is not that way. It's not corrupt. It's edifying. And it's, uh, you know, you're thinking more about a different way of speaking, acting, thinking, you know, and, and that grieving. The reason why we don't like to hear those that language or we, the reason why we don't like to smell cigarette smoke or marijuana smoke or the smell, uh, those things, we don't do those no more. We have the Holy Spirit in us and that grieves the Holy Spirit. It's uncomfortable. We start hearing music or we start hearing bad, you know, things or seeing things. We don't. We don't feel good or feel right because it's uncomfortable. It grieves the Holy Spirit, you know. But that, thank God for the Holy Spirit. Thank God for your grace. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 <clears throat> right, I, I like Isaiah chapter 6, right? He said, I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell with, the, with, <clears throat> with people who are unclean lips, right? <laughs> when he went before the Lord. Uh, but but we are to speak. <clears throat> we are to speak only what is helpful. We are to build others up according to their needs, right? We are to speak only what is helpful. We are to build others up according to their need, right? Mm -hmm. But learning, <clears throat> learning this is asking God for wisdom, right? We need Him to give us the right attitude. The right words. We need to be so filled with God, with the word of God, with the spirit of God. <clears throat> That's the only way that we can do these, do this thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, we see that Job's friends are known for one thing. And that is on how they failed Job. Right? Mm -hmm. They are known for failing Job. Job's friends had an opportunity to help their friend. <clears throat> this was the most significant thing that they were given to do in their lives. At least from the perspective of the book of Job, it is the only thing we know about them. <clears throat> they were Job's friends who came to help him when he was sick and they failed. And Job called them what? Worthless physicians. Right? <clears throat> I mean, that was their main mission right here is to come to Job, to lift him up, to encourage him, to speak life, words of encouragement, right? <clears throat> and they, and what happens, Job called them worthless physicians. Miserable comfort is here in cha chapter 16. Let's go to Job chapter 16. <clears throat> Job chapter 16, verse 1 <clears throat> reads, then Job answered and said, <clears throat> uh, verse 2, I have heard many, many such things. Miserable comforters are you all. Verse three, shall words of wind have an end? Or what provokes you that you should answer? Right, verse four. You want to take that? I also could speak as you do if your soul were in my soul's place. I could heap up words against you and shake my head at you. Hmm. I'll verse, read verse 5. But I would strengthen you with my mouth. And the comfort of my lips would relieve your grief. Though I speak, my grief is not relieved. And if I remain silent, how am I eased? Yeah, I like what he says right there. I also could speak as you do. If your soul were in my soul's place, I could heap up words against you. And shake my head at you. That's verse 4. That's Job telling his friends, huh? Yeah, but look what he says in verse 5. 
Yeah, but I would strengthen you with my mouth and the comfort of my lips would relieve your grief. I mean, you got to speak life. You got to speak word of encouragement. I mean, especially if somebody's down. That's true. That's true. You know, and, and it takes it takes patience and, and, and wisdom and understanding to, to have the compassion to, like, like it said about hold your peace in verse 13. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, thirteen thirty said to hold your peace. You know, and and I remember, uh, I think somebody told me, uh, like in uh, the New Testament, when uh, it was spoken to hold your peace, meant to be quiet. You know, right. like shut your mouth. But it goes back to what we've listened, where we've heard from our parents when we were little. Don't say anything if you don't have nothing nice to say. But right. But, Told them I would strengthen you with my mouth. I mean, in other words, I would I would encourage you. I would I would comfort you. I would lift you up. I would you know uh, bless you. Right. And the comfort of my lips would re- relieve your grief. I mean, we, we know it's been done to us, and we've done it to others. When we tell somebody and comforting words and blessings, they say, "What? Thank you very much. I appreciate that. You, I feel uh, you know what? I, I feel better now. You know." I, I'm glad I talked to you and, you know, to God be the glory because we know those, those, that compassion and those words came from the Lord, you know, to comfort that person and relieve their grief. Vice versa, you know, somebody tells us, hey, you know what, brother, it's going to be all right. You know what? And you, and you, you know what? You're not dumb or you know what? You're, 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 you're going to be OK. And, and you know, uh, you're going to be uh, feeling better. Your body's going to, you know, things like that, you know, to comfort not to, not to what, what they said. They were terrible comforters, right? He called them miserable comforter, comforters. Yeah, that he did. Um, and, where does that- it, and where does it come when you tell the truth? <laughs> so if you see him messing up, you can't tell him the truth? How does that work? It says to speak the truth, but speak it in love. You know, mm-hmm. we could say, okay, la. <laughs> and he said, you know, say something to him, and it's the truth, but you didn't say it very kindly, you know. You didn't speak it in love. And that's where we fall short, too. Sometimes we speak too quick. My, my dad used to say, tell me, Mijo, think before you speak. You know? Right. And if we have the Holy Spirit to say, you know, because hey, hey, I know I've said things right away, and I, oh, I wish I would have said that, you know what I mean? I meant what I said, but I didn't say it right, you know? Mm-hmm. Two ways. Two ways. People are going to take it. They're going to say, "You know what? No, it's okay. You know, you said it like that, but you know, I have to hear it like that." You know, that's somebody that's mature that could look through the look through the offense of the words and say, "You know what? It was rough, but I'll receive it because I had to." You know, but then there's somebody that's going to say, "You know what? Why are you talking to me like that? You know, you could have said it. You you didn't have to say it like that." You know, so depends. Our words are very powerful. Hmm. But like you said, that's a good point, Ernie. What if you say the truth? Because sometimes, you know, the truth sets us free. The truth hurts. I know in the in the Bible it says the truth sets us free. Uh, I don't know if it says the truth hurts in the Bible, but I know that the word cuts through bone and marrow like a double-edged sword. And the word is truth. Come on, somebody. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Sometimes you, gotta, sometimes you got to think about it and go like, well, what I think is not as important, but what God thinks and what God Ooh. would want us to say is more important. Yeah. Not maybe. what we think, you know, God would yeah. say, let's put it a different way. Yeah. Yeah. If you can, you, we, we're, we're going to make a mistake when we think of selling the truth. We're going to say, that's oh, yeah, that, yeah, that, that, that's ugly. And then there, God, and God would say, "Well, don't say it like that. Just say I would not choose that myself personally." But you know, yourselves, you're thinking like, "Dang, that's ugly, girl." You know, <laughs> and you don't want to yeah. make them feel bad. Uh, we always <laughs> got to consider their feeling. You know, consider right. others' feelings. Put their feeling first. Yeah, it's right. not easy, but we have to do that. Yeah. How would yeah. you feel if somebody just straight out told you the truth? Because we could do that, and it's not it's not kind sometimes when you tell people the truth. Because let's face it, they could tell me the truth, a lot of stuff about me, and it probably wouldn't be good. You know, sometimes I'm selfish. Sometimes I'm narrow-minded. Sometimes I'm stubborn, you know. Uh, sometimes I just don't, you know, 
give a darn. And, and that's, that's a very selfish behavior. And if somebody wanted to come and tell me that, I couldn't deny it. So if it, I wouldn't like it. So sometimes we have to avoid that. Just do it in a way that how can we uh, encourage them in a nice way when we say it, you know? I maybe would I wouldn't prefer that, and maybe they can try something else instead. So yeah, you're right. How we do it is what's important. That's one of my main weaknesses. That's that's like the most hardest thing I'm going through right now. Yeah, I, I need to learn how to do what you just just taught me today. And because sometimes people I see them their their stuff, you know, and equal to the mom and no one like well you need to stop complaining you need to start doing this and this and that if you want to change your life and i just tell you how it is and i, I still need to learn what you guys are teaching me and that's very 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 wise thank you amen i mean the truth that they were trying to speak to joe some of it was true some of it wasn't <clears throat> but this is what paul writing to the philippians said in philippians chapter 4 verse 8 <clears throat> He says, finally, my brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And then verse 9 reads, and the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me do these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. It can't get any clearer than that. <laughs> Amen, right? I mean, whatever things are of good report. So, do you, what do you, I mean, do you have something good to say, or is it cheese man, or what's going on there? Oh. Right? Whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue <clears throat> and if there is anything praiseworthy, right? I mean, is it praiseworthy, or are you just trying to throw somebody under the bus? Mm. Is it gossip? That's not praiseworthy. What's praiseworthy? Oh, praise God. Can we say that? Mm. Right? Is, any, is there anything praiseworthy? Meditate on these things. And then verse 9 reads, The things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of what? And the God of peace will be with you. Amen. Amen. I mean, Amen. Amen. That's 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 really good. That praiseworthy. And you know what with, with the words too, like the talking about encouragement and what they what they didn't do to Job, his friends, is encourage him, but they were just kind of criticizing him and uh judging him in a sense. But you know, it said about these words, these these don't let corrupt words proceed from your mouth, it grieves the Holy Spirit. Because when we're, if it's praiseworthy and we're encouraging somebody, how it says, how Paul said in Philippians 4, like you, you read, Pastor 8 and 9, you know, praiseworthy, admirable. Think about these things that are excellent, worthy, worthy of praise. Because if it is, not only are we blessing those, that person we're speaking to and encouraging, but it pleases God. He's listening. And if we're going to be judged by every word we say on earth, which it says that we will be judged on the things we said. Let's let's really think about what we're going to say next time, you know. And and right. like, what Jim, like what Jimmy said about, well, what somebody's asking, well, what do you think about it? Well, you know what? Not it's not what I think. But let's like how you say, Pastor, and other pastors would say, well, let's go see what the Word of God says. <laughs> I know, you right? Know, I, I, what I Joe's say, friend? Sorry. Let's, what were huh? Job's friends doing? They were like, Job's friends were kind of going like, well, maybe you deserved it, you know? I, you know, you probably deserved it. Karma's a karma's a mother, you know? You probably deserved it, Job. That's why it happened to you. And he's like, that ain't helping me feel better, right? Yeah, exactly. Like he said, though, though I speak, my grief is not relieved. And if I remain silent, how am I eased? He said, but I would strengthen you with my, with my mouth. And the comfort of my lips would relieve your grief. What you guys are, what you fellas are telling me, that doesn't, that's not working, man. <laughs> no. no, we're it supposed to opposite. tell them, we're supposed to tell them, we may not have the answer why this is happening, but we know this is for God's plan. And we can't go against God's plan. But one thing he promises us that everything's going to be okay if we have trust and faith in him. 
not because I'm telling you this, but because the Bible tells us that. And God does not lie to us. He keeps his word. It's true. And he always keeps his word. So we need to focus on not what we think about it, but what is God doing here? We accept his will no matter what. If it's good or bad, we know he's doing it all for the greater good. And he may give us and he may take it away, but he, he can give it back. And he can even give us more. They need to give encouraging words to make Job feel that there is something that's going to come good from this if he gives it time and he puts his faith in God. Not, hey, man, you probably deserved it. You know, remember the last time and you were doing this and that? Maybe it's true. You know, maybe it's karma. Um, so that's what we tell people. I know I tell people that. I say, you know what? We do know one thing. If we trust God, we know is everything's going to turn out okay. In the long run, it's going to be okay. And that's not because I'm telling you. It's because the Bible tells us that. If we put our faith in God, we don't understand his ways. They're mysterious to us, and we don't know why he's making us go through this. But we do know that it's for a good reason, and something good's going to come from it. Because that's what he tells us. We just have to trust in him. Just be patient and trust in him. And we will see why he's doing this eventually. And then we're all done. We'll probably look back and say, that's why it happened. Amen. Wow, brother. You just sent chills up my spine. Those are very, very wise. And I seen a big mistake on myself. That is, wow. So, yeah, different. so different. Yeah, you know, the story of Job, I'm just, because I'm going through some stuff and, and I see myself, uh, you know, where I failed and said with my words, with my family and with people, you know, and, uh, I feel a conviction, you know, because it's it's uh, it's uh, chipping off some things and sharpening me, you know what I mean? And at the same time, I go through the fire, but it's all for something, not for nothing, you know what I mean? And these guys, these friends of Job uh, and Job himself, they didn't have the Bible to learn stories like we're learning about their their things, about we're learning about Job for ourselves. I don't know what they, you know, it says sometimes that we learn from others' mistakes, and their choices weren't the best choices. And we make the wrong choices as well. I know, speaking for myself, uh, I do that daily with sometimes the things I say and how I react or act uh, with people, you know, my family or whatever. And um, But I'm just tripping out on how we're learning from Job and we're learning from his friends uh, what not to do or what to do, you know? And because they didn't, they didn't have nobody to learn from. They didn't have no stories to read together like we're reading right now. <laughs> about them you know but uh it uh, it really is uh it really is um i say like you said uh ernie right now wow the holy spirit's really doing something here right now for me i know personally uh same here i I have a conviction over myself you know i mean just moments ago i'll tell you guys moments ago i'm you know my i've been going through it i've been going through it not like job but you know been going through some things where i'm very frustrated and uh, sometimes it comes out, you know, like uh, like like um, how you read earlier, Pastor in Isaiah in chapter six, verse five, how his his lips are filthy and he lives around around men or people that are, have filthy lips too. You know how Jimmy was speaking about the world. You know, I mean, I'm not necessarily speaking about corrupt words, filthy, but just the the the. Uh, blurting out things sometimes when you're angry you know or not or not lifting not not lifting somebody up but bringing them down you know not comforting you know so you know what i i i realized i was i'm not saying i used the f word but we have to be careful in general how we speak it's not just the f word i mean i make it a point that i don't curse i don't curse i don't like cursing but even just careless talking like I was using the word retarded you know when somebody would make me angry and they were not they were just making me frustrated I would say you know why are you being so retarded and I said it a little bit more often than I should and I didn't really think it was a big deal until one day I was on the phone talking to somebody and I was arguing with them and I said why are you acting so retarded as I was saying that, I walked into a store and there was a girl, a younger girl that had special needs. And when I said the word retarded, she looked over at me and it looked like she was sad. 
Mm. And I thought, there are people that are retarded and it's not a joke and it's not funny. They, they're, they're, they have to suffer with that. And God did not make me suffer with that, but there's actually people that suffer from that condition. And that made me realize that it's not a word you can carelessly use. It's a, it's a condition. And to carelessly use that, it's making light of somebody who actually does have that. And when I saw the, the, the sadness in her eyes, when I said that from a distance, I thought, I'm going to stop using that word. Right. And, you know, God pointed that out to me. And, and I wish I could have went up and said, I apologize, but instead um, I, I, I stopped doing that, you know, but that was becoming a habit, you know? So we, we have to be careful when we talk and consider others. When we talk to people, you might be talking to somebody and you might say, oh my God, that, that guy is so old. And then there's an older person in the room and they, they know they're old and they feel bad now. You know, or I have a habit sometimes and say like, and my God, that woman was so fat. And then we got a fat guy sitting in the room, you know, and, and I'm fat sometimes. We're all fat, you know, but that person might have a, a conscience feeling about that, you know, or they're skinny or they're, you know, we have to think about how we speak in front of others because something we say may affect others. And we don't even realize it. So we always have to be conscious of what we say and how we talk in front of others. You know, God, Jesus didn't do that. You know, he always thought of others before he spoke. And before you open your mouth, you have to know what's coming out. Um, think before you speak, you know, and that, that's important. We, we have to do that. Uh, it's, it's hard to do that sometimes, but we do, you know, it's, it's important. We have to think before what we say and what we do, how we talk to others. Um, it's, it's very easy to fall short of that, but we have to be wise. What does it say? Even like people that are like, I say, you know, you know, he was a man of few words, but he was a very wise man. You know, he didn't have much to say, but when he spoke, he took his time and thought about it and, and he gave you a clear answer and he thought before he spoke, you know, not just somebody just, you know, and then all of a sudden, like, oh my God, these guys are saying the craziest stuff, you know. Um, we all have that habit. I, I had to control myself when I talked. Like I said, that, that, that girl put me in my place. And um, I'll remember that the rest of my life. It taught me a lesson. Wow, thank you so much. Amen. Amen, Brother Jimmy. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> but yeah. It's um, it reminding me of Luke six forty five <laughs> that says that it says a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evilness evil treasures of his heart brings forth that which is evil, for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. I mean, out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. So what's in your heart, mm. right? And then verse forty six of Luke chapter six. And it says, but why do you call me Lord? Lord, and do not do the things which I say. Right? <laughs> we just learned in Ephesians chapter 4, for 29, right? Let no corrupt word come forth out of your mouth. Right? But he says right here, it says, and, and, and then verse 43 of, of Luke chapter 6, it says, for a good tree does not bear fruit, does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Verse 44, every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs of thorns, nor do they gather grapes from bar bush. Right? Verse 45 says, a good man out of the goodness of his treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good. An evil man out of the evilness of his heart brings forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth, the mouth speaks. So what's in there? Right? Verse 46 says, but why do you call me Lord? Lord. And do not do the things which I say. I mean, if that's not convicting. Uh, the other thing that came, the other first that came to my mind was Proverbs 16, 7, right? Ooh. It says, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kiss of an enemy is deceitful. You know, a bit those words weren't faithful, <laughs> faithful wounds of a friend to, to Job because they were lies. Mm. We know that the enemy was behind his friends yeah. to get him to curse God. His mm. wife, también. 
to get him to curse God. I mean, to commit suicide, man, just kill yourself. Curse God and kill yourself. Commit suicide. Why not? You might as well. I mean, yep. so yeah, I mean, uh, and referring to four, Job 64, I could speak like you if you were in my place. I could make fine speeches against you and shake my head <laughs> at you. So he asserts that it, that if he were in their place, he would do much of a better job than Job. I mean, if he asserts that if he were in their place, he would do a much better job of being a friend and counselor than they have done. Notice that. Mm -hmm. Right. Right, and then we word five. Did we read five yet? Have I taken uh, any? Oh, did you read five? Did you read up yeah. to five? Verse five, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, but my mouth would encourage you, and comfort, comfort from my lips would bring you grief. Would bring you grief, right? Relieve your grief. So, um, the. Um, well, let's go ahead and read it. Let's continue to read the chapter. Uh, Ernie, you want to take that? Uh, verse 6? Yes, Pastor. Amen. Yet, uh, Job chapter 16, chapter 6. I mean, verse 6. Yet, if I speak, my pain is not relieved. And if I refrain, it does not go away. Surely, God, you have worn me out. You have devastated my entire household. You have shriveled me up. What? Shriveled. Shriveled me up. You have shriveled me up. And it has become a witness. My countenance rises up and testifies against me. God assails me and tears me. Tears, tears me in his anger and gnashes his teeth at me. My opponent fastens on his piercing eyes. People open their mouths to jeer, to jeer at me. They strike my cheek in scorn and unite together against me. God has turned me over to the ungodly and thrown me into the clutches of the wicked. All as well with me, but he shattered me. He seized me by the neck and crushed me. He has made me his target. His arches surround me. Without pity, he's, he pierces my kidneys and spills my gall on the ground. Again and again, he bursts upon me. He rushes at me like a warrior. 15. Uh, Jimmy, you want to take that? <clears throat> Are we on Job again? Uh, yeah, Job 16, uh, 15. Job 15, 16, correct? No, 16, 15. 16, 15. I have sewed sackcloth over my skin and buried my brow in the dust. My face is red with weeping. Dark shadows ring my eyes. Yet my hands have been free of violence. And my prayer is pure. 18. Earth, do not cover my blood. May my cry never be laid to rest. Should I continue? Um, Richard, you want to finish it off? Okay. At starting at verse 19 to 22. Surely, even now, my witness is in heaven and my evidence is on high. My friends scorn me. My eyes pour out tears to God. Oh, that one might plead for a man with God as a man pleads for his neighbor. For when a few years are finished, I shall go the way of no return. So he had very limited um, 
knowledge of of death, of of, of the resurrection, actually. Mm-hmm. Right? Because I mean the New Testament says to be absent from the bodies if you're present with the Lord, right? To him, death was that was it. Go his way you know? of no return. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Kind of like what reminds me of what my dad used to say, no, mijo, the, the, the day you die is that's the end of your life. I go, no, dad, that's not what the Bible says. <laughs> I go, yeah, and of course, he changed his mind now, you know. He goes, yeah. oh, man, there's <laughs> life after death, man. <laughs> yeah. When you die, it's just the beginning. <laughs> yeah, my dad but, used to say, you, you go to you die, you just go to sleep and you're in the ground, mijo. There's nothing there. That's it. It's black. Right. Go, no, yeah. There's heaven and hell. I mean, that's what Job is saying here. <clears throat> you know, he's he's saying that that's it. I mean, just like he spoke in Job in uh, chapter 14, 14. Chapter 14, 14. <clears throat> what did he say there? 14, 14. Uh-huh. He said, you would call and I would answer. Oh, no, wait. Can the dead live again? If so, this would give me hope through all my years of struggle, and I would eagerly await the release of death. Wow. They had no idea about everlasting life. Well, it hadn't come because Jesus hadn't died for the world, right? Right. The the new covenant. Wow, that's crazy. That's just like an atheist, kind of, you know, because I know uh, a very... Well, it was my daughter's great grandfather. He was Dr. Willis Bird, the nicest man you ever want to meet. Just as humble and gentle. And I asked him one day if there was life after death. And he said, no. He said, there's not. He says, we're organic, just like the animals and just like the plants. We have a life cycle where we're uh, born from a seed and we're germinated from another uh, species of that seed. And then we become a cycle of spring and summer and fall and winter and then you're pretty much nothing exists after that and it moves on to the next harvest of seeds and we're just all organic just like creatures and uh plants we have nothing to do with after this life we basically have no conscience and no existence and no remembrance of the past he said you're just basically uh as if you're asleep because you when you're asleep and you don't dream it's just you're not even aware that you're asleep and and he was a doctor and a very wise man and he was i i talked to him i I always picked his brain for many years but that was the thing that was uh kind of confusing um and you know what though i kind of would look at it and think about it but then I would go on YouTube and I would see doctors who were atheists that God took them to heaven and from a near death experience and they came back and they're like, no, they were wrong. There is a God. And they said, once they passed over that line, they were present with the Lord and the Lord warned them that we're all going to be judged and that he, they wanted him to go back. And let me tell you, those people change their lives, their thoughts, and their behavior and the way they thought about things. There's many people that have been shown from God that there is life after death. And it's Man. so similar that you can't doubt it. And so I, I wish that I had been in a point in my life where I could have influenced him in a way so that he could have been saved by Jesus and accepting the Lord, but I was not even myself really uh, involved with God and Jesus. Then I was a young person and it was all about just living for the day and enjoying life and all that you could uh, party and have fun and drink and just who cares. But he was, he was very humble, but he did not believe in God or the existence of God or life after death. Uh, It was very, very confusing because now, you know, I, I can't see how uh, people can deny God that way. But the devil says many people will be deceived. So he was probably deceived from uh, knowledge and he had a high degree of knowledge. And that knowledge. deceit, knowledge is not always the best, um, will be deceived. 
in many ways, what did he say? Many, many people will be deceived in many different ways. And he, he had his way of being deceived. Um, but go on, I'm sorry to interrupt. Well, that's okay. It's, that's good because that that's a good explanation and a good example of uh, the carnal man and the spirit man because we are flesh, like that doctor said, we're organic, we're animals, but we're not animals. We're creation and created in God's image. And he had no knowledge of that. If he, I mean, uh, it sounds like he was just believing in science, which there is science and, and like, you know, the universe and all that stuff. And a lot of atheists or Darwin, uh, Darwinists, they think about that. But then, like you said, they come to the revelation that there is a God and there is a creation and stuff because they have these near death experiences and God allows them to come back and they don't keep it to themselves. We know that because they share it. And that's exactly why they were given the opportunity to uh, stay alive and not go to hell. But there's some that have gone to hell believing that lie. And uh, his man, this man was into knowledge, but like his own understanding. And he didn't really give his uh, spirit man a chance to live or give it the opportunity because God gives us a free will and a choice to choose him or lean on our own understanding and read books, 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 have degrees and all kinds of stuff. But that's carnal that you never elevate. You never grow. You never transform into the spirit man, you know. You're just going to grow in knowledge uh, and wisdom, but it's earthly wisdom, not uh, the wisdom from the throne of God. So that's, you know, that's too bad. That man, I don't who knows. So, you know, he passed away thinking like that. Yeah. Yeah. I saw him pass away. He passed away um, without too much warning. He suddenly got sick from lung cancer. He never smoked a day in his life. Never cursed, never said it. He was so calm and peaceful and just gentle and humble. Uh, yeah. But his wife would smoke like a train. And he, I think he got sick from secondhand smoke all the time, got lung oh. cancer, and died within a month. But, you know, the other thing is, <clears throat> not to get off the subject too much, but I think uh, throughout always, the, the devil is always trying to deceive us because he's fighting for our soul. He wants to take our soul to hell. And God's trying to save our soul. Jesus is trying to save our soul. Uh, and, the, and it doesn't end. It's always been and it always will be. So we have to be always on guard. I was reading. Uh, I didn't know a lot about it till I did a little research, but everybody's probably heard of the Sumerian tablets that they discovered. The Sumerians were, according to the history, were here and recorded history even before the Bible and thousands of years before the Bible, before Christ. And their whole thing is, it's really very, cool. it's very similar where Enki was a God and Enki was a God of earth. And Anil was a God of the heavens, the, the, the universe, the sky. And they were saying that there are many gods, but Enki was uh, had a form of uh, scales like a reptilian like a lizard and he was the god of earth it's funny how he was the god of earth he is a reptilian and enki they said that they created all the men uh, and women on earth and they wanted to uh, decide to do something so enki decided he wanted to make all the people of earth much smarter and equal to the gods and isn't that funny how the, the garden of eden remember the snake said if we ate from the tree of knowledge we'd be just like gods and we have all the knowledge of gods that's what anki wanted to do to them and he didn't care if they worshiped him but the god of anil from the heavens in the universe he wanted the people to worship him and uh without a, without any say so and have just follow him and worship him and and everything and in the end of the story they're saying why would we want to follow a god who cares does not care about us wants us just to obey him worship him and not be as equal to him when enki on earth wanted to change humans to be just like gods just as smart as gods and would not have to worship him and and he's the one that we should be following enki is the one that we should be following because he's the one that really is giving us everything we want 
And doesn't the, the, the devil say that too? I'll give you anything you want. He even said that to Jesus. I'll give you anything you want. Just worship me and not, not your God. And God doesn't say he's going to give us everything we want. He doesn't say we're going to have a perfect life. But he does say to follow him and worship him in the afterlife, you will have those things. And if you do, you'll have a better life just by doing so. So they turn it and twist it and try to say that we're following the wrong God. We should be following the God of Enki, which really resembles Satan. And the God of Neil resembles God, And if you look at it. But those are the Sumerian tablets that they're bringing out now that's trying to discredit the Bible and say, this is a true history of the world, of the people. And it's really weird. I, I saw it because I saw the word Enki uh, in a business, and it looked like a reptilian person with wings. And then I started to do more research and find out that he was a god of earth, of the people. And I said, this is just another way for people to be deceived and, and Satan always wants us to not believe in God, not to follow God, not to believe in Jesus, but to follow him and worship him. It, it's just really strange. Uh, I didn't want to get too far off topic, but I just thought I'd throw that out there. Uh, many will be deceived. So we always have to be on guard for these things. Okay. I could go into further, but I know it's a long thing going on. Sorry about that. No, it has me pumping. As me going, like everything you're saying, it's making sense to a lot of things that I lived in. Um, I mean, you have me pumping. You have me going. Honestly, it, it also reminded me of the life story that you gave us a few weeks ago to where you knew this person that everybody should follow her, listen to her, because it, it's almost the same thing. If you connect both of them together, it, it sounded the same thing. We have to be mm -hmm. cautious on guard. It's, it's uh, Antichrist. It's Antichrist. So anything uh, not of God and what we know in the Bible is anti-God, Antichrist. And there will be many Antichrists and there will be a great deception. And that's what it is. It's just a distraction or deception from the truth. You know, because if it if it's not the whole truth and nothing but the truth, even if it's a little lie, it's a lie. You know, and Satan is the father of lies and and cannot speak the truth. They'll use the truth for to lie, like telling Adam and Eve a little bit of the truth. You know, oh, well, you know, God doesn't want you to be. Well, there's a reason why parents don't want you to do this and do that. It's for your best interest. But yet, sometimes we want to do wrong anyways, right? Because our flesh is weak. Our spirit's willing, but our flesh is weak. And so somebody would influence you, say, hey, you know what? Your dad doesn't want you to know, do because then you one thing my friends told me when I was in gangs, I'm not going to get off the subject, but one thing when I was in gangs, I used to get spanked when I was a kid. And uh, up until about 15, 16, I was still getting spanked. And my homeboys said, you know what? Just keep on doing wrong and your dad will get tired of spanking you. And that made sense to me. And it was true. My dad, after a while, said, you know, I don't know what to do anymore. It's not working anymore. And I started messing up more and more. But just that little deception, that lie, is just like how people will say, you know, they'll tell the truth. Well, yeah, Satan is the God of this world because only because God gave him control for a while, you know, for a while. And uh, like we can ask why, but that doesn't matter. All we have to ask is, uh, what do you want me to do, Lord, to help people not be deceived and be lied to? <laughs> know the truth and show them the truth. But you know what I mean? Luckily, he left us with the Holy Spirit. If it wasn't for that, it would be really hard to follow God. You know, once the Holy Spirit's in you, it's a much easier task to follow God. But without it, it's very difficult without the Holy Spirit. It's very difficult. You, you're going to be you're going to be misled. You're going to be pressured. And you're going to be influenced by the world and your friends and peers. And without the Holy Spirit influencing us. It's easy to be misled uh, because you know what? Everybody's doing it. Everybody's having fun. The biggest thing was everybody would say like, well, you know, everybody's going to go to hell and that's where all your friends are going to be. And they're all going to be one big party. And they would think it's a joke. But when you really research it, you would not want that on your worst enemy when you really research it and realize what it's all about. 
You would not want to be there and you would not want anyone to be there. And again, going back to those near death experiences, some of those people that have near death experiences that meet God and meet Jesus and see heaven, some of them go to hell and they, and they're in hell. And the only way they can get out is by calling out for Jesus. And he comes and he pulls them out of the depths of hell. And he talks to them and explains to them, this is where you're going to find yourself if you continue down the path you're on. He gives them another chance. And they change. Of course they change. But so we have to put things in perspective and not take things so lightly, especially when we're young and we have no maturity. It's so easy to make light of things like that. But when we start to become mature, we realize it's nothing to make light of. Uh, we're all going to be judged. And when we are, we're going to feel so ashamed of the way we behave and the way we've acted and the way we treat others. We're going to want to walk over to the hell side ourselves and because we're so ashamed of what we did and what we said and how we acted. So we have to be on guard and watch ourselves. And, and luckily, we, he forgives us of our past and we can move forward. And that's the love of God and Jesus. We're so fortunate that we get second chances amen amen yeah i quoted isaiah 43 10 and 11 at the beginning of the study and it says before me there was no other god formed neither shall be any after me for i am the lord besides me there is no other savior <laughs> you know but you will be deceived if you don't know the word of god you know john 14 6 says, i am the way the truth and the life and speaking about the you know that this whatever was there before the Jews or what have you, I had the same situation with a friend of mine. Uh, he said that the, he said that the, um, the Mayans were here before the Jews. And I was going to Yucatan at the time. He says, well, go find out. You're going to find out that the, you know, that the Mayans were here before. <clears throat> I went to visit one of the pyramids and one of the sites we went into the store, you know, where they sell all the, you know, their, you know, their stuff that they have for souvenirs or what have you. I went straight to the bookstore and I saw the, the Mayan Bible, right? And I, and I looked at the book and I'm reading through it. And my wife goes, what are you doing? I go, no, I'm just, I need to prove a point, whatever. She goes, well, how much is the book? I go, 20 bucks. What's 20 bucks? So she let me buy it. <laughs> but I was reading about the Mayans, right? <clears throat> and it said, it said it was a Mayan Bible. And it pretty much said it pretty simple. It said that the first man that was created was made out of clay. And I'm like, well, that sounds kind of like what the Bible says, right? Genesis yeah. 2.14 says that God formed man out of the dust of the ground, out of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils, the breath of life, man became a living being. I go, well, it's funny, pretty much, right? You know, out of the dust of the ground, boom. Okay, made the man out of clay, breathed into him. <laughs> okay, so, so according to the Mayan Bible, uh, that mankind, that mankind that was created first was destroyed. The second man that was created was really interesting to me because um, when I go to my wife's, uh, where my wife's from, she's from Zacatecas. And in Zacatecas, they have a museum. And her mu in her museum, she's from Jerez, Jerez, Zacatecas, in this little town. They go to the museum. <clears throat> And I walked into the museum one time and there's a lot of paintings, a lot of drawings. They're saying that they're children of the corn. And I'm like, wow, this is what the Bible, Mayan Bible says, the second creation, that they were children of the corn, you know, they're made out of corn. But see, according to the Mayan Bible, they were destroyed too because they were wicked. So God destroyed the, 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 the children of the corn también, you know, I mean, the corn people, right? And so the third people that were created were wood people. Right. And when I came back, I was talking to my friend, you know, he was telling me, well, did you get the, what did you find out? I go here, man. And I got the book in my hand and I'm handing it to him as I'm talking to him about the third creation, the third people that were created, they were made out of wood. And as I handed him the Bible, the Mayan Bible, I told him, could that be where Pinocchio came from? <laughs> <laughs> I go, so there, so there you are, you know, there's your Mayans were here before, before, before the Jews. Okay. There you are. And you know what? He took the book, he took that Bible, the Mayan Bible woman never spoke to me about it again. And it was a time where, and it was a time when, when the Mayan calendar was being, was already clicking. It was already, I know I remember getting to Yucatan and the, and, and the, and the, they even had a clock in the airport. It was like click, click, click. So supposedly, 
it was the end of the map. It was the end of the of the Mayan map. Yeah. It, it, count, it was a countdown that the world was going to come to an end. Yeah. So there you are. You know what I mean? I remember that. I remember everybody was afraid that the Mayan calendar was going to end, the world was going to end. It right. was going to polar shift and a shift is, and we're going to do a polar shift and we're yeah. going to die. And the way they say, God only knows when that's going to happen. He's not revealed that to anyone. And, and what is the, I think, I don't know the quote, but there was God, the Bible said, many of my people will be deceived for lack of knowledge. And that's why we have to have Bible study. So we have knowledge. So we yeah. cannot have, we're going to be saved through the knowledge that we're learning. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, gotta Hosea think. 4 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. <laughs> you gotta, we, that's why you gotta know the word, amen. Right? You gotta know that word. So, this is what we have in, in, in verse 7 of Job chapter 16. <clears throat> it says, But now you have worn me out, you have made my desolate all my company. Right? <clears throat> he says, surely you have worn me out and you have devastated my entire household. Right? So here's his complaint with God. <clears throat> his complaint to God is that. That, um, that you have devastated my entire household. Right? The flock that I had, the camels, the sheep, the goats, the, I mean, and my 10 children. Right? So you have devastated my household, right? God has assaulted Job's body through disease. In verse 8, you have bound me and it has become a witness. My godness rises up and testifies against me. God has attacked him violently like an enemy. Verse 9, God assails me and tears me like, tears me in his anger and gashes his teeth at me. My opponent fastens me on me, his piercing eyes. Right? God attacks me because he is angry. I look at his face and I look at his eyes and I can see how angry he is. Men have become, men have become hateful towards me. Right? Verse 10 of Job 16. <clears throat> As Job uh, sixteen ten says, they gape at me and their mouth, and they strike reproach, reproachfully on my cheek. Right, <clears throat> crowns of people say things about me that they are not that are not kind. They are not afraid of me, and they even slap me. They even slap my face. Right, verse ten says, men open their mouths and jeer at me. They strike my cheek and scorn and unite together against me. Um, and verse 12. I was enjoying my life. <clears throat> then he held me and everything changed. He held my neck and hurt me. He has shot arrows at me. Verse 13. Soldiers with bows seem to around me, seem to be all around me. He tears my my he tears my body and my blood falls on the ground. Still he does not feel sorry for me. 14, he attacks me again and again and he rushes at me like a soldier. So God has assaulted him wave upon wave. Uh, Job, his body is repulsive. I have showed sackcloth over my skin and bird, buried my brow. And dust, my face is red, weeping. Deep sorrows, deep shadows ring my eyes. Right, I have cried so much that my eyes are red. I am so tired that there are shadows under my eyes. All this happened to an innocent man. Right, 17 through 18. <clears throat> When you guys want to take that, 17 through 18. Amen. From the New Living Translation, it says, Yet I have done no wrong, and my prayer is pure. O earth, do not conceal my blood. Let it cry out on my behalf. 
Mm. Right? Um, it's, but I have done nothing. I have never, I, I have never done anything that was cruel or wrong. And when I pray, I speak honestly to God. Verse 18, I ask the earth not to hide my blood. I do not want people to forget me. I want them to hear my cry for help. But in chapter 17, we see Job's uh, lament. And he says, death is my only hope. Right? Because none of these words are, are bringing Job any comfort. Whoa. Not bringing Job any comfort at all. <clears throat> so Job launches into a deep and bitter lament here in chapter 17. 1 through 16, Job feels completely shattered by his trial. Um, let's go ahead and read 17. Okay. We're going to start. Go ahead, Brother Richard. Okay, I'll, I'm going to read from the New King James Version. Uh, verse 17. Uh, one to what, brother? Uh, uh, just take three. Okay. Verse 1 uh, from chapter 17. Oh, my spirit is broken. My days are extinguished. The grave is ready for me. Are not mockers with me? And does not my eye dwell on their provocation? Now put down a pledge for me with yourself. Who is he who will shake hands with me? Verse 4. Ernie, you want to take it? Amen. You have closed their minds to understanding, therefore you will not let them triumph. If anyone denounces their friends for reward, the eyes of their children will fail. God has made me by word to everyone, a man in whose face people spit. Seven. Seven. My eye, my eye has also grown dim because of my because of sorrow and all. My members are like shadows. For say, upright men are astonished, astonished at this. And innocent, and the innocent stirs himself up against the hypocrite. Verse 9. Yet the righteous will yet the righteous will hold to his way, and he who has clean hands will be stronger and stronger. Uh, Jimmy, verse 10. But come on, all of you. Try again. I will not find a wise man among you. My days have passed. My plans are shattered. Yet the desires of my heart turn night into day. In the face of the darkness, light is near. If only if the only home I hope for is in the grave, if I spread out my bed in the realm of darkness. 14. Yeah, finish it, Jim. If I say to corruption, you are my father, and to the worm, my mother or my sister, where then is my hope? Who can see any hope for me? Will it go down to the gates of death? Will we descend together into the dust? Mm. Right. I mean, he says it's better for me is death. <clears throat> better for me is death than for my and for the worms to eat eat my corpse. I mean, think about that. He right. says, my spirit is broken and my days are cut short. The grave awaits me. He says, I am very weak. <clears throat> I will soon die. Then my friends <clears throat> will bury me in the ground. Right? Verse, verse 11 says, my days have passed. My plans, my plans are all shattered. <clears throat> and so are the desires of my heart. Right? I will not live for many more days. I will not be able to do the things I wanted to do. So Job reached a point where he sees nothing, nothing good, nothing good left in his future. Everything he ever sets his heart on 
in this world has been ripped from it violently. What else is left to hope for Job in this world? Mm. More sheep? More oxen? More <laughs> camels? <laughs> I mean, you think about that, right? They know, right? <laughs> I mean, he says my he says my spirit is broken, right? Uh-huh. You know, Pastor, um, believe it or not, it's very it's very coincidental, but just yesterday I was uh they sent me to a location out of the blue. It was like I was in one place and I've been there for like going on three months in Burbank, but there was an emergency in Beverly Hills where they said, I have to be there. And they said, they will not accept anybody but me. I've been there before. It's two share, uh, ex sheriffs that are now attorneys. When they have a client that threatens them with violence or, or deadly force, they send me out there and I go there and I'm there. And that didn't really uh, occur as, as you know because I'm I kind of like the guy who doesn't show up or he sees me he doesn't go come in but what was what I was there for I didn't realize it until we're reading this today and right now that last uh, scripture was saying because there was a guy outside the lobby door and I was watching him and he was gesturing with, with me and then I went out there and I said what's the problem and he said can you please shoot me you know, because I have a gun on myself. And he goes, please, I'm begging you, please shoot me, shoot me, please. I don't want to live anymore. And I'm telling him, I go, well, what's the problem? I'm not going to shoot you. He goes, please. And I said, I'll pepper spray you if you keep bugging me and don't leave. And he goes, no, I really want to die. He said, he said his wife took off. He hasn't seen his children in a long mm. time. He lost his place, his this, that, and the other. So I told him, I said, you know what? You don't know what God has planned for you. You're not the first person that has gone through this. You're not the last that we all, and you have to keep faith. You have to believe. Have you tried speaking to God about this? You're talking to me about this, but have you talked to God about this? And um, he was just wanted to die. And, and he was begging me to shoot him and kill him. And I said, I don't know. I don't have the answer to your problems, but I, I guarantee you, if you talk to God about it, he'll give you an answer and he'll tell you what to do. But, dying is not the answer uh i told him are you hungry and he said not too much. i go well why don't you do this i'll give you here's six dollars i have in my pocket i said here's seven i said i'm going to keep one dollar i'm going to give you six and i want you to go get something to eat and i want you to talk to god about this because that's what you need to do don't talk to me don't talk to men you need to talk to god about this your life is not over and you have a lot of life ahead of you. And you may see your children again one day, but not if you kill yourself. So if that's what you miss and that's what you want, you need to get through this. And uh, and and then he went on and, and he showed back up and he just gave me one of those thank you kind of nods. And I said, go, you know, you hang in there, be strong. Uh, but this is exactly what this man's going through. He, he wanted to die. You know, and it's just kind of odd. I didn't really think about it until right mm -hmm. now when we're reading. Yeah. Um, but he needed encouragement. And um, and what else could I tell him? You know, um, but it just reminds me of that right away. I, I didn't really think about it because when we're reading Job, mm -hmm. you know, he keeps talking about he might as well be dead. He wants to be dead. But, you know, at first I was thinking of it like. You know, when people are going through a tough time, they're just going like, gosh, I wish I was dead, you know. Right. Uh, but but this guy, way he was telling me on the street and the way Job is describing it. Now I get it. Now I see the relationship when your life is you're losing everything that's important to you. And you just don't have the will to live anymore. Uh, but that was uh, it, I just realized what kind of pain and difficulties they're going through that would make them want to feel that way. Amen. I saw it firsthand. That's, you know what? Thank you for sharing that because that, you're right, Jimmy, that man lost his hope and you gave excellent uh, counsel, right? I mean, there's no, no, no doubt in my mind that God sent you there, you know, for that specific time. And uh, when that guy came and gave you the, hey, all right, you know, thank you. I mean, obviously some food and everything and thought about it. And I, I pray that he did go talk to God. And I pray in the name of Jesus that God speaks to this man, you know, 
and gives him the answer and he seeks God and, and uh, God puts his angels around him that he doesn't harm himself. Yeah, and of course, when he walked away, I, I made a silent prayer for him. Yeah. And, um, and it's weird, you know, like God puts us in a place for a certain reason. And I always say that too. Wherever I'm at, whatever I'm doing, that's what, exactly what God wants me to do. And that's exactly where he wants me to be. And I don't know why, but I know that's what it is. And that's the way it's going to be. And I'm not going to worry about anything else. I may not be where I want to be. And sometimes I may not even be doing what I want to do. But whatever I'm doing, wherever I'm at, it's God's plan. So I'm just going to stick with it, whether I like it or not. I didn't want to go out there. I was trying to get somebody else to go in my place. And the sheriffs were like, no. We want you. You're the one. We cannot. We're not going to try to other people. You're, you're, and I thought, okay, I guess I'll go. And so I had to go the next day over there. Uh, and then after that, that's the only day they needed me. So I, I didn't realize the purpose until we read this part right here. Maybe that's what it was about. Um, yeah. You know. And and there's another. Uh, you know, God puts us in places to do His work. I think sometimes, not giving myself the credit for it, but. He wants us to spread the word and let him know there's hope, not in man, but in God. That's where Amen. I put my hope. Amen. That's key. Can I, just, can I just say something right now before, you know, you got this at the end. And I also got something at the end too, Jimmy. Pastor could summarize this whole story of Job here. Because at the beginning, when when the sons of God go to, hev go to heaven to the throne of God, and Lucifer's there, Satan's there, and God tells Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Because he's found to be faithful, righteous unto God, right? And when in verse 15 and 16 at, the, at, at, uh, at chapter 17, when it says, where then in verse 15, where then is my hope? As for my hope, who can see it? And, and, and that's in the New King James, in the New, New Living Translation, it says, where then is my hope? Can anyone find it? Verse 16. No, my hope will go down with me to the grave. We will rest together in the dust. Now, not thinking that there's life after death. Job is thinking it's over. It's it done. And right here, when it says in the Bible that the faith is the substance hoped for, the evidence yet not seen. Faith is what the devil was after Job about. If God found his servant Job to be faithful, to be righteous, it's his faith. And throughout, throughout the story of Job, his faith is tested and tested and tested. Even when he's discouraged, even when he's, the words are coming against him, even when it seems like right here in chapter 17, where, says, where then is my, my hope? As for my hope, who could see it? it really, you, could tr you translate it into where is my faith? As for my faith, who can see it? And that's where the enemy comes at us to try and destroy our faith. Because in Hebrews eleven six it says, And without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes before him must believe that he exists. And that he rewards those who diligently seek him. If the devil can destroy our faith, he wins. You know? Because our faith in God is what we hold on to. The faith is the substance hoped for, the evidence yet not seen. We don't know. For only what the Bible tells us, we believe. Amen. Faith, we walk by faith and not by sight. Like that man who you spoke about, he walked by sight, what he read and science and all that. He didn't have the hope in God or the faith in God. And Job, you know, that, that's what I got a revelation. This man, that you, his, his hope was just to see his kids and he felt it was all, all gone. But you know what you gave him? His measure of faith that God gave him? You watered it, you know. You you gave him hope, and I and I bet you, I, you know, it wasn't in vain, you know. Yeah, and and he was talking about he he was he was going to kill himself. He wanted to kill himself. That's all that was going to happen. That's he already made up his mind, and he asked me if I would shoot him. He kept telling me, "Please, I'm begging you." And he wasn't mentally ill. He wasn't like you know those crazy people. No, he wasn't. He was just going through a really tough time. Um, you know, when you hear about people committing suicide and you hear about people uh, shooting up everybody and then killing themselves, the first thing I think about is that they're definitely not believers in Christ because they couldn't do that. God says 
don't kill yourself, don't kill others. You know? So that's the sad part about it. I say, if they knew Christ and they knew God, that wouldn't happen. Those people are yeah. already under the control of Satan and he dwells inside them. Right. He's right. controlling them. And that's why they're willing to do these evil things, kill others and then kill themselves. They, and I say, if only had God been inside them, they would never be able to do that. And that's why we have to always try to influence others so that when they're thinking of these things, uh, we can change their direction just by planting the seeds. Like Lalo always says, planting a seed in them. They may not fully understand it at the time, but they may think about it. Uh, I always get people out of jail as my bail bonds uh, job. And I always tell myself when I pray for the men in jail, and I pray for them because they're alone and they have nobody. And like James said, when somebody said, how do you handle it when you're in there? He said, well, first of all, ain't nobody your friend for reals. And you need to be understanding that you're in there alone. And the only friend you have is God and Jesus. He's the only one that can save you. He's the only one that can take you out of there. He's the only one that can protect you. And he's the only one you can trust. So you better cling to Jesus. You better at, reach out to God. And that's what I always pray for that. God watches over these men and protects these men. And even when the families call me and say, I need to get my husband, I need to get my brother out, I need to get my son out. I say, okay, I'm going to do my part, but you need to do your part. And they say, what? I said, I need you to pray for him as I will, that God watches over him and protects him and gets him out of there safely. And we're going to do our part. But most of all, we want to pray that while he's in there, that he reaches out to God. And that God will listen because when you're in there, of course, everybody knows you're going to start to talk to God. You're going to start to ask him to get you out of there somehow. And that's what they need to do. That's the first thing they need to do. Um, so I think that's uh, just an important thing to remember uh, when we're at the worst part of our lives is when the time that we need to get closer to God and not think all these negative things, and not lose faith. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, those are the things that, those are the, those are the, the statement that we say, divine appointments. <clears throat> you were there for that divine appointment. Because <clears throat> God was using you there to speak life, to speak encouragement <clears throat> um, for that man, right? <clears throat> First Corinthians 3, 6 is, I planted Apollo's water, but God gave the increase, right? <clears throat> but praise the Lord. Um, we, we always got to pray for that, that God would use us mightily. Yeah, I didn't even think about it until we read this right here. Then I, I put it together. I, right. I said, you know, how can, how can Job, you know, and then I think, wait a minute, this man was just like Job. Yeah. I didn't realize until right now. Yeah, just like right here, 1711 says, my days have passed, my plans are shattered, and so are the desires of my heart. Everything he, everything he ever set his heart on in this world has been ripped from him violently. What else is left for, what else is left to hope for in this world? More sheep, more, ac more oxen, more camels? I mean, really? <laughs> Gosh. But what did he long for? He longed for a mediator. He longed for a mediator, someone who would go between him. I told, him the Lord, I told him the Lord gave you that, and he took it away, but he can give it back to you. I told him in his time, if you're patient, he can give right. you even more. I told him but you need to have patience and, and know that it's not under your control right now. You know, And, and he did listen. He did listen. Right. So Amen. I was happy. That's so, good, Brother Jimmy. It's, it's really weird. I didn't think about it until this last part of the, the chapter. But And like I said, I always thought Job, the book of Job was kind of boring. But the more mm -hmm. we focus on it and the little parts like that, I'm thinking like, hmm, I can really kind of relate to it now in different ways than before. Amen. All right, hermano. Richard, pray us out, brother. It's already 1230. <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> I know. You know, I got 2% on my phone right now, brothers. Uh oh. And see, we make it. Recording <laughs> in progress. 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 Okay.
Okay, praise the Lord. Sorry, man. <laughs> I had to switch phones. Amen. Right. You hear me? Amen. Yeah. You hear me? I'm in black and white. Oh, you... now. I don't know why I'm in black and white, but hey, praise the Lord. So, Father God, we just thank <laughs> you, Lord, uh, for this awesome time, Lord, uh, to fellowship in your word, Lord. And then in... you hear me? Oh, praise yeah. the Lord. You hear me? Yeah. Uh, so, Lord, yeah. we thank you. Thank you, Lord. And uh, Father God, just you had your way tonight, Lord. And I just pray that we have a multiplied rest tonight, Lord. And, and Father God, uh, thank you for this uh, this servant Job, Lord. That uh, Lord, we know what the enemy meant for evil. You turn it to good, Lord. And, and there's nothing that we don't go through that, that Father God, that you can't turn around, Lord. And Lord, we're learning from it, Lord. We're learning from these things that Job went through. And even with the things that his friends failed at, Lord, Father God, may we never fail at this area, Lord, to Father God, let our words and our thoughts be comforting to others. And uh, Lord, Father God, quicken us, Father God, when we, we go that route, Lord, Father God, to always remember and be mindful, Father God, of this lesson. And Father God, to, to uh, let our lips be blessing, Lord. Let, the, let it be praiseworthy, Lord, Father God, as we read tonight. And Ephesians, Lord, and all the scripture, Lord, that, that uh, we, we hear, Lord, let it be etched in our heart. And let I just pray that all of us brothers can uh, seek you more and, and be able to memorize scripture and low scripture, Lord. Just give us that spirit of excellence, Father God, in our memory, Lord, as uh, Pastor uh, has said. And he's a, he's a good example of it, Lord, to just write it down, write it down and uh, just go over a, one scripture, one verse daily lord uh so we can memorize it lord because it's very it's vital to to our our our, our walk with you lord and, and and the word is the sword lord it's our defense and it's our it's our protection lord as well as uh we battle it and we uh we can slay demons with it lord so thank you lord father god for the word tonight the study tonight and bless the brothers on here tonight and the brothers that couldn't make it lord we just lift up uh brother tony lord and his family lord right now and all those morning lord we lift them up to you lord comfort them lord there may be pain in the night but joy comes in the morning so lord uh again thank you for pastor and the brothers and for your word and the holy spirit lord may it all be a blessing to us father god and may we share it with others in jesus mighty name amen and amen amen brother amen, yeah. amen. Pastor, yeah. sorry about talking so much during that i didn't realize i was over talking on a lot of this stuff tonight i didn't realize how late it was so forgive me about no. that no, the thing is that that helps the other people, other people that might be listening in, because we got listeners like, you know, I mean, we don't have a major listener, but, but you know, the little bit that we speak, uh, you know what I mean? It, it could be an encouragement to others, you know, because God works divinely, right? It I might be something that somebody's going through. Somebody needs to hear that. Yeah, when it relates, I like to just express how it relates to me. And, and uh, it's amazing how these stories and these people in the Bible can relate to us in modern day times and how we can put it into perspective right. and use it and, and it's just like it's beautiful and i and and it's wonderful when i get this and i take it with me so we will not perish from our lack of knowledge thank you for providing this knowledge for us pastor without you guiding us i know i would not open the bible and i would not be able to understand the bible as much as i do without you leading us thank you god bless you and your family yeah thank you and brother, brother Jimmy and brother uh, um, Richard, Amen. Me, there's different types of people of learning and other people learn differently than other people. And the way you guys, the way we read and you put it examples in life and then I compare it. Wow. You guys just gave me a lot of, a lot of wrongs that I'm wrong in that I need to work on myself, which I understood it very well to where if I would just read it, I wouldn't understand it. But the way you guys explain it and make it sense in real life, that's what, at least in my knowledge, is the way it enters my mind. And I want to thank you guys for, for that. Thank you so and much. You, and you too, Ern, Ernie. You, you've said some very wise things, too, that I've learned from you. You When you made some interesting points, I, I take away things that I've learned from you, too, brother. It, we all have so much to learn from each other. So God bless all of you, and thank you too, Ernie, and thank Brother you. Richard, and Pastor, and all you brothers. I, I I learned from all of you guys. You always have something wise and beautiful to share. Thank you for always doing that, all you brothers. Thank you. Amen. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Right, Thank you, brother. Have a good night. Have a good you, weekend. Pastor. Good night. Amen. Good night. See you guys. Good Love you guys. Love all you brothers. Good night. Amen. God bless you. Rest God bless. Bless. I'll see you in the morning, Pastor. Okay. <laughs> Thank good you, night. brother. Lalo. <laughs> Hello, Lalo. Buenas noches, Lalo. You too, Lalo. We love you, bro. Hey. All your help and support.